some skeptics <clears throat> classify truth seekers into three groups. First, those who think they have found the truth. Second, those who admit that they have not found it and who claim the impossibility of anyone's finding it. And then third, those who continue to look for it. If truth, though, is not humanly attainable, then salvation is impossible. Yet, even as David mentioned in his lesson toward the end, we have preachers, teachers, uh, college professors, and on you can go, who have and do deny the possibility of absolute knowledge of God and of truth. And thus, this study as to the attainability of truth is an essential study. But when we study this, there are some things that we do not know. Some things are only knowable by revelation and very simply, God has not revealed them to us. Uh, how many times in a Bible study class someone asks a question and you hear a response something along the lines of, well, that's a Deuteronomy 29.29 29 question, which states that the secret things belong unto God, or the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Now some people only think about that first part. The secret things belong unto our Lord. Well, there are some things that are belong to God. He has not revealed them to us. Thus, we do not know. But he has revealed some things. And that's the latter part of the verse. Those things that are revealed belong unto us. That's uh, also a discussion in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses 7 through verse 10 in particular, where they were speaking the wisdom of God in a mystery, hidden wisdom before. But then he goes on, while we by our human knowledge and wisdom cannot find that, God, verse uh, 10, God hath revealed them unto us. God has given us, he has revealed to us certain knowledge, even though there is certainly some knowledge, some things that he has not revealed. But then if you think about it, God really cannot reveal all that he knows. Contrary to popular opinion, all men are fallible beings. They are not infinite, while God is infinite. And thus, there are certain things about God that the finite mind cannot comprehend. And isn't that what Paul says in relationship to God in Romans 11th chapter, verse 33 through verse 36, when he talks about the, oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed to him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. There are some things about God 
that we just simply cannot fathom because we are finite and we are limited by that nature. And thus our knowledge is limited even among those things. But then there is knowledge that has not yet been discovered even though it might be and is discoverable. Now what do we mean by that? Think of the advancements that have been made in just about every field of study. Think of the knowledge that existed, let's just pick out a date of 1500, as opposed to now. Have we gained knowledge in just about every area and every aspect? They didn't know back then, why? Because the advances had not been made at that time for them to know. Even though through the years and through study and through advancements being made, we now understand. We can know those things That's even true regarding God's revelation. That we might not know something dealing with God's revelation because we have not spent the time and the effort to learn it. Even though it can be learned, it can be known. Some, sad to say, and I would almost say most and probably be right about that and probably say a great majority are no longer willing to put forth the effort that it takes to come to know. They would rather be spoon fed by somebody from the pulpit and whatever he says is going to be right because they're not going to put forth the effort. They're not going to be like the noble Bereans of old. Peter talked about that there were some things hard to be understood that Paul wrote. Doesn't mean that they could not be understood, but people had to put forth the time and the effort to come to a knowledge of them. And apparently even then, some people weren't willing to do that. But then to state that I know some things does not mean that we know everything. I can know some things without knowing everything. And to state that something that I do not know certain, some things does not mean that we cannot know some things we can come to a knowledge and we can thus know that we know. But how can we come to know? How can we come to know that we know? Well, you have set, set forth several ways in which we come to knowledge. First is psychological means. And some have used the statement, I think, therefore I am. Human consciousness is a fact. And one can comprehend his own consciousness by his mental reflection. We can probe our own mind. In that 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, as Paul was talking about, here's the mind of God and the spirit searches the deep things of God. He uses man as an illustration of that in verse 11 when he says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Here's man, the spirit of man within himself, and he knows certain things because he knows his own consciousness. He knows what is in himself. But notice that he knows what is in himself. 
I know certain things. I know something because I am comprehending my own mental state. And some might say as unstable as that might be. I appreciate that amen, Brother Dub. <laughs> but also we continue, we keep learning certain facts. And we can know then that we know them. Second is by empirical means. That is simply by utilizing my five senses, I can come to understand certain information. There is, to a great extent, my spirit is connected to and housed within my body. So I am able to gain some truths by my body's relationship to the physical universe. And my body can affect my spirit as well as my spirit can affect my body. Now then, consider what Jesus says, quoting Isaiah, that as to why he is speaking in parables. Because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And thus the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in them, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Now notice those are dealing with the physical senses. And he says, they have closed themselves off to those physical senses which should have brought them to knowledge. But then notice what he goes on to say, they have closed their eyes, they've closed their ears, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. They could have come to an understanding and thus salvation based upon those things which they could see and which they could hear. The physical senses was connected to their spirit but they had closed off their spirit to not allow those physical senses to affect themselves to come to a knowledge. They could have come to that knowledge, though. In relationship to idols, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 28, he talks about that they should serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Now notice this, which neither see nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. All of those dealing with the physical senses, empirical knowledge. And he says, these idols that men build, that they make, they don't have that capability. They're, they don't have that knowledge as a result because they cannot use those physical senses. We can when we look at sin, we oftentimes go to 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is, of the or is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Notice two of the three deal specifically with the physical body, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the physical body affecting the spirit resulting in sin in this case. There is that aspect of the physical body that affects the spirit. So by empirical 
evidences we can come to know. But then there's an ontological means. Ontology very simply means being. There is in the nature of being a way to prove the possibility of human knowledge. No one can criticize or deny the possibility of knowledge without presupposing knowledge. You going to deny something without the possibility of it existing? And so by their attacks against the possibility of knowledge, they've got to acknowledge that it is at least possible. No one can deny the reality of the laws of thought that have been discussed this week. The law of identity, the law of excluded middle, the law of contradiction without making use of those laws of thought. They have to use them. For example, if one says that he knows that no one can know, well, everybody laughs because we've heard this so many times. How do you know that? Are you sure about it? You see, we immediately recognize he has contradicted himself, a logical contradiction. If he says that he does not know, and no one can know, though he suspects that such is the case, then he admits at least the possibility of knowledge. That's the idea of ontology. And so they, by that, he admits at least the possibility of man knowing. But then there is revelation, revelational means. I can know that I can know because God said so. God told me so. Thus, I can know it by revelation. God states that man can know saving truth. And not only that he can know it, but that he must know this truth. John 8, 31, 32, a passage referred to often. Jesus said to those Jews if you, who believed on him, if ye continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He affirms that you can know the truth, and through that knowledge of the truth, you will be made free. There's salvation. In order to be saved, you must know. You must know the truth. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, when it says concerning God who will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. There's a coming to the knowledge of the truth, knowing the truth. But in this verse, the ultimate end is stated first. The ultimate end is that God would have all men to be saved. That's God's desire, that's God's wish, but that's the ultimate end for each and every one of us. Every man, God wants to be saved. But then he tells us the means by which we can attain that salvation. The means is by coming to a knowledge of the truth. You cannot attain the end, that is, being saved, in any other way other than coming to a knowledge of the truth. Therefore, if any man is going to be saved, doesn't matter who it is, if any man is going to be saved, he has to know the truth. You cannot be saved any other way. And that's the import of what Paul is saying here. God's desire is that you be saved, but in order to be saved, you've got to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
In John 6 chapter, after these people, uh, Jesus, because they needed food, he fed them. They come to Jesus then, searching him out because they got their bellies full and they wanted some more of that, to put it uh, in my way of speaking. And so he starts teaching them a very difficult lesson for them. With the result, a lot of them leave. Turns to his apostles and asks them, you going to go as well? And in Peter's response is found in verse 69. He says, we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now then, another study would be that of faith, belief. And in relationship to that belief, what is it? Well, it's, to a great extent, it's knowledge, knowing. We believe, what, based upon the evidence that has been given to us and has been provided for us, the miracles that we have seen and observed Jesus perform, the voice out of heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And all of the other evidences that were available to them, they knew that Jesus was the Christ. And he says, we are sure of that. There's a certainty about it. We know that we know that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Bibles tells us we can know. In 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, in verse 3, Paul is talking about some false doctrines forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving. Of them which, now notice this, of them which believe and know the truth. There is a knowledge claim that Paul is making that you can know the truth. Are you sure about that? Well, yes, Paul was sure about it. You can have knowledge. But for God to communicate with man, whether it be direct, as with the apostles, or indirect, in relationship to us through the scriptures for God to communicate with man implies the possibility of man's understanding what God is saying if I say something to brother David I am at least implying the possibility that brother David can understand what I am saying unless you're some of these uh, idiots who say, well, words can mean whatever they want to mean, and uh, I can understand yes to be no, and no to be yes, or maybe, or whatever I want it to mean, and gone into utter stupidity. I'm at least implying that he can understand it. So is God when he communicates with man. He is implying that man can know what he's saying. If man, though, you take the argument, man cannot understand God's communication to him, then you're going to be on the horns of a dilemma, one or the other. Either God has the ability to create a message that man, his creation, can understand, but he wasn't good enough to do it. He wasn't benevolent enough to do it. He gave a message, but he knew that you couldn't understand it anyway. What type of a monster is that? A monstrous idea of God. The other horn of the dilemma, though, is that God had the ability to create a message that man could understand, but he... Well, he did not have that power. He didn't have the capability of doing it. Then you attack the very nature of God, his omnipotence. 
So in one case, you either have a God that is not good enough to do it, or one who is not powerful enough, doesn't have the ability to do it. Now, which one do you want? Or the other alternative is that we have a God who can communicate with his creation and the fact that he did. Another way to prove that we have and knowledge or that we can at least attain knowledge is by falsifying agnosticism. Proving agnosticism is false verifies the possibility of knowledge. And again, going back to that, either it's possible to know or it's impossible to know. That's the only alternatives. And if an agnostic should say, I know that no one knows, he's contradicted his own position again. He has made a statement that I know, a knowledge statement. Even though his knowledge statement is saying, I cannot know what I just said. If an agnostic again says that he does not know and that no one can know, he admits the possibility that agnosticism is a denying the possibility of knowledge. Agnosticism cannot be verified. It cannot be set forth as truth. It's easily falsified, proven false. When you prove agnosticism false, though, you then prove the possibility of knowledge. While it is possible for one to know and to know that he knows, it is impossible for one to know that he cannot know. Knowledge claims are possible because one is aware that he has or possesses certain information. Then the question, though, comes, why the Bible if we cannot know the truth? Why do we have it? Why did God write the Bible if his creation cannot know what it contains? What good is it? Of what value is the Bible? But the fact is, we can know. We can know that we exist. David mentioned that in the last lesson. We have certain not. I, can't, I know that I exist. I've met a couple in my lifetime that tried to claim they don't really know whether we exist or not. It's all a big dream, supposedly. Well, I said, well, someone needs to hit you in the nose and then you can know whether or not you exist. I won't tell you I offered to do that, but uh, I didn't do it. It's silliness. It goes into the realm of something that is totally abstract idiocy. We know that we exist. We know this universe exists. We live in a universe. We know that it exists. We know those things. We also have to know thus that there has to be an adequate explanation for this universe. It's required. This universe exists. How did it come to be? Why does it exist? There has to be an adequate explanation for it. So what do some do? Because they want to deny God, they come up with this idea of evolution, but we all know evolution is not an adequate explanation for this, ex this universe. It cannot explain what we know exists. God, the eternal mind, if you will, is the only adequate 
explanation. And thus, as Genesis 1-1 states, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible exists. And the only adequate explanation for the Bible is the fact that God wrote it. This isn't a lesson that deals with proving the Bible is God's word, but it's easily done. There are a multitude of ways in which to prove the Bible could not have been written by man. And if it has not been written by man, then there is a God, and God is the only adequate explanation for the production of the Bible. Now this book, that Bible, requires that I come to a knowledge of the truth. We read 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. The Bible requires that we come to a knowledge of it if we want to attain salvation. Is this a salvation issue? Absolutely it is. Because you cannot be saved without coming to a knowledge of it. This book also requires that I obey the truth. In Galatians 5 and verse 7, it says, ye did run well. Who did hinder ye that ye should not obey the truth? There is obedience to the truth. And this book requires that I obey that truth. If I can't come to a knowledge of it, then there's no way that I can obey it. If I can't come to a knowledge of the truth, there's no way that I can know God exists, that I can know Jesus is God's son, that I can know that the church that we read about in this book, well, we can't really understand it because thus any old denomination will do. Because we can't really know it anyway. We can't know that Jesus built one church and that church is the church of Christ. We can't know the organization of the church. We can't know about the worship of the church. We can't know what God requires us to know in order to be saved from our sins. We can't know what it takes to live the Christian life. And thus, this book requires that I not only obey that truth, but that I abide in that truth. I remain there. And that means remaining there throughout my entire life. Again, John 8, verse 31 and 32. That Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I have to remain in it. I have to abide in it. I have to continue in what God's word says. The truth. And if I don't, then I will no longer be Christ's disciples, or Christ's disciple, and I will be eternally lost. The only way that we can attain eternal salvation is by knowing the truth. And that means I can know that I know it. How we need to appreciate and by, abide by the biblical concepts of knowledge. And we need to resolve to resist all agnostic efforts to take us away what God has said we must know and that we must obey and that we must abide in. And it's only through our knowledge of that book, that truth, that we are going to be in a position to confront error, as David's lesson was all about, to defend the truth, 
to put error to flight because if we can't know the truth, there's no such thing as error. If I cannot know the truth and know that I know it, then what they say might be right. I can't know one way or the other. And so if the evolutionist comes along and says, well, God doesn't exist, I can't really say whether he's right or wrong. Why? Because I can't really know. No, we can know those things. And we must know those things. We can attain truth and know that we know it.